Hi, my name is Benedict. Welcome to episode five in the Effective Music Making series. This time we are taking a step backwards. So we're not going to be inside the sequencer as much, although we are, really. Uh, and we're looking at arrangement. This should not be done before. We actually have our piece going where it's going, where it needs to go for itself. And remember always, when I'm writing a piece, I'm not the god of the piece. The music itself is a being in its own right, delivered to me by the song gods or whatever. Uh, but if I fall into the trap of going, but I'm the god of the piece, it's going to do what I want it to do, chances are I'm going to make a lot of problems for myself which are unresolved and therefore end up being expressed to the person listening. The person listening is looking for a certain feeling. They're probably not looking to hear your stress manifest. Even if your song is a oh, woe is me, um, I love you all but I can't love you kind of a thing, that doesn't come across as a um, kind of a stress as a result of the composer trying to implement themselves rather than the song. Alrighty. The variation that we looked at last week is the little brother, and you notice we did look at some arrangement. Arrangement is high level, so it's big picture from which we work on the little details. The arrangement is the chapter of the books. The, the variation is what's inside the chapters and the two must work in hand in hand. Often I see them not working hand in hand, and that's where things go wrong. Before we dig into the material, I will remind you again, please support me for this. There's a lot of work. There's at least 10 hours per episode that goes into this. But more importantly, if you were hiring a music teacher, you would be paying at least $60 a week for these lessons, uh, Australian, and... I put these online with no direct having to buy in, but I think it's only fair if you're getting value from them that some value is returned. So please pop over to my coffee or Kofi uh, and uh, and send some value back in some way. Sending value back is a really important part of supporting yourself along with supporting me, of course, to enable me to support you. So the most important thing that we could look at here is that music must flow. All too often, music made these days does not flow, which means that I even question whether it's music. That relates somewhat to what I said before about trying to be the god of it and forcing things onto the page. How effective is slavery in running a successful country that lasts for a period of time, a long period of time? Well, just as a hint, the Romans learned it didn't work very well. Now, it's not that the Romans got rid of slavery altogether, but the Romans learnt that when trying to manage particularly other countries, you needed them to buy in. So you had to have a good flow. The people in those countries that were under Roman rule had to see that they got some benefit. So they had to be able to go back to Rome and become citizens once they'd done enough to justify their citizenship. That's getting into the realms of politics, but it's important. The song, the story... The piece must flow. And an arrangement is a big level of how we make sure that we have a piece that flows. If things don't flow well, it breaks. Last night we just watched um, 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 The Rock in Black Adam. And the problem was that the film ended up feeling broken the whole way through because it didn't flow properly. And I don't know whether it's because some stuff got edited out that helped explain... But all the way through, we're not entirely sure who to root for because we've got um, Hawkman and his buddies, but they almost look like they're bad guys. We've got uh, The Rock, who, of course, we want to because he's the, the centre character of this film. Um, but he can be a little badly behaved, but at the same time, we kind of want to root for him too. And the people who are supposed to be the arbiters of good and right and just are acting like prats. And they're actually pissing off Black Adam with, well, no good reason. So what happened there is the arrangement of that story was broken, 
which leaves us walking away from that film with a feeling of a bit broken, which is a shame because otherwise it could have been a really nice, fun couple of hours of our lives, you know, perfect matinee movie sort of thing. So the story must flow. If it doesn't flow, you've got problems. Now, the main thing that you will encounter, you go online and you type in, how do I arrange my song? Then you will get lists of this is what you do. A, B, A, B, C, A, C, B, D, blah, 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 blah. Commonly expressed as you have a verse, you have a chorus, you have a verse, you have a chorus, you have a, a bridge or a middle eight, a screaming guitar solo, uh, and then you go chorus, chorus, ad libs to fade. That's merely one style of arrangement. There are lots of common enough forms of arrangement. But I would discourage you from going online and or getting a book and going, what are the forms of arrangement I must use? Because quite often tracks that are successful use an unusual kind of arrangement or have tossed the usual expectations out the window and it's part of why they work. Uh, at the time, OMDs in Nola Gay, this was 81 or so, and they actually hit with a, with a 50s style arrangement. In Nola Gay, is compelling as a piece of music, totally ignoring the backstory. But its arrangement is actually a little odd if you look into it, especially for its time in, in the early 80s. But it's actually a 50s style song, which is not at all uncommon in the early 80s because there was a lot of rockabilly that was underpinning things. Tainted Love is a rockabilly song. Uh, so do what you need the story to be doing. Or more to the point, to be more consistent with myself, do what the story needs to get done. So following formulas, because that's how it should be done, is probably an unwise idea. Follow what your story needs. There are some stories, like films, that are told backwards. I mentioned the film Memento recently, uh, and that's a very odd construction. But it is very successful because of its odd construction, because of its odd storyline. And that works. If they'd tried to tell it in a more conventional manner, it would have been like, ho-hum. But the arrangement of that story, Guy Pearce movie Memento, is a big part of what makes it successful in its own way. Yes, it's not a simple straight in a straight line, but it's not a simple and straight line kind of a story, well, at least not from Guy Pearce's character's point of view, which is what we're trying to get us into. So let's break down and look into the parts that you're going to commonly encounter and are generally, in one form or another, a little non-negotiable. They should be there probably in some form or another, particularly in a more conventional pop-rock kind of a format but that doesn't mean that they aren't relevant. So learn what they are, and then you can decide how they need to be arranged. Obviously, a piece must begin. Something has to start somewhere. Hello, my name is Johnny Cash. That's the beginning of the Johnny Cash show. It centers us, it puts us in place of what we're there for. And you might go, well, that's not necessary because I bought a ticket and it said Johnny Cash on it. And I sit here and everyone's wearing their Johnny Cash t-shirts and their cowboy hats. And um, the announcer came on saying, Johnny Cash. And then out walks this guy who's all in black, and that's clearly, well, it's Johnny Cash. And he goes, hello, I'm Johnny Cash. Why does he do that? That's to really put us in that place where we are part of the Johnny Cash experience. The start is super important. I've encountered far too many tracks, especially in groups and forums, where they start with something like a four on the floor. Doop, 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 doop. And a minute later, you're still doop, 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 doop. <laughs> I remember asking a guy um, about that, and it's like, you've got such this long intro that's just got no real purpose. There's nothing unique about this. It doesn't show what's coming. It's like, oh, well, that's the, that's the DJ's mix break. And my question is, who did you write this song for? Oh, well, you need to have a mix break. Um, yeah, I'm not opposed to those things being there. I grew up in the time of high energy, so a 12-inch version of Hey, Hey, Guy or um, Living on Video probably started with a cut-down version of the song or of its rhythm to help lace from one track to another. So I know all about that. 
But that was the 12-inch version of the song. It wasn't the 7-inch version of the song, which you were selling to most people on the radio. So the question, again, is who are you writing for? And in that sense, so many people are writing for DJs. Okay, I get you think, well, if I can get a DJ to play this. So selling to DJs has some merit. But what causes a DJ to want to play a song on the floor, assuming your music even is, a, is floor fodder? I know mine isn't. Ultimately, it's going to come to the conclusion that the DJ is only going to play it if he thinks it's going to make the girls wiggle their backsides. If it's not going to make the girls wiggle their backsides, the DJ is not going to play it, no matter how amazingly perfectly useful the mix break is. At most, the amazing perfectly usefulness of the mix break might be that he will use it and then never get to, to your actual song because your actual song doesn't make the girls wiggle their backsides. Your target always has to be who is your audience? If they are young 18 to 23-year-old girls who work in offices and go out um, once a week to wiggle their backsides with their uh, handbags in a circle in the middle of themselves, then okay, that's what you've got to focus on. You've got to deliver that. And all the other stuff. So in other words, how do we get to that target market as quickly as possible? This is the start of the track. You listen to really successful tracks and like the radio version of them and they will start with something that's compelling. Gunner's Sweet Child of Mine. Oh, hello. Compelling. In Ola Gay, which I mentioned before, compelling. So make sure that that start is compelling. Uh, an incredibly famous one, of course, is uh, Michael Jackson's uh, Mum, 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 Beat It. Actually, he outright stole <laughs> from a Synclavier um, demo record. But nonetheless, it makes a really compelling start to uh, a, a very powerful song. But without that intro, the song wouldn't have been as successful because at that little beginning that says, oh, now we don't want to overdo it. The purpose of our start is to set the scene. Where is this happening? Michael Jackson's Beat It, with that clang, 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 is conflict. It's like, oh, that's arresting. There's something clangorous about this. So do, 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 do. When that comes in, that's what's referred to as showing the wares. Because the very initial bit, the synclavier sound, clang, 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 that doesn't really relate to the song at all. It's tacked on. But do, 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 that's showing the wares. That's how I was taught it. You show your wares. So if you start with something that doesn't really relate to the rest of the song, you're okay. That can be arresting and just get people to go, oh, what's this? Uh, but you need to also be looking at showing the wares. If your song has a funky beat, then you want to have some, at least, of the elements of that funky beat early. Now, people will perhaps think, oh, well, I'll start that early. I often start my intros at the beginning, but in a track like we're going to work through here, the intro probably comes a lot later by extracting some of what is in the song. So remember, my job here is to actually show what's inside the song, to show what's coming, so people can decide, is this for me to disco my backside to or not? Will I sit this one out? Will I have a G&T so that I'm feeling loose with my goose, caboose? Your start has to show people what you've got and be arresting, but in a way that is relevant. There are quite a few songs that's had wonderful starts and then just... Some of them become hits, but a lot of them just disappear. We then probably want to move into a verse, but not always. In this case, we'll show that we don't. The verse tends to be downplayed, especially these days in hyperpop or whatever we call it. You know, when we hear Trailer Swift going on about something or other, the verse often is pretty irrelevant um, and generally, sadly, is gibberish. The verse is actually incredibly important. The verse is the setup for your chorus. Your chorus is your payoff. It's your money shot. Uh, your money shot isn't worth an awful lot if there isn't some kind of explanation for it, to put it into context. 
Now, our problem with the Black Adam movie that we watched was that while Rock put in a good performance, he was the Rock, uh, there was something broken about the explaining what was going on. And the verse is a point where you explain what's going on. Each verse tends to have a slightly different role. Your first verse tends to set the scene. Woke up Sunday morning and uh, had a hangover and I worked out and I saw that the woman had left me and blah, 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 a mishmash of people's songs. Um, that tells us what this song is going to be about. And I, I sat in front of the mirror and she'd sent me a poison pen letter. Aria speed wagon. Uh, so we need to start by giving some people some sense about what this song is going to be about. The second verse needs to fill that out even more. If it's just more cliche drivel, we're not adding anything, people get less interested. We're not expanding the story. It's just like, yeah, whatever. Hulk smash. Yes, I know Hulk smash. So we've got to continue to add value. Later verses, particularly common in country, is that a later verse will often turn the story around. A favourite example there is um, uh, a Gary Allen song that um, that actually turns around the expectation or, or that he set up through all the first parts of the song. It's not the best song ever written, but once you've heard it a few times on the album, it's like such a charmer, which is why it's such a solid album track and gives you reason to want to come back to the album. You don't go back to the album because of the singles. You go back to the album because it's full of songs like that that are wonderful, and that's what makes you hear the album a couple of times and then go, I need this in my life, and go to the shop and buy it. This is, this is why you've got to get your verses right. The next component, commonly, is a chorus. Now, the chorus, commonly in pop songs, is written first. So you've got this strong hook, and then your verses work out the rest of what's happening. It's entirely up to you how you write, but it's not uncommon for choruses to be written first. I honestly don't remember what I wrote first in this. I think it may have been the verse that was written first, and then the uh, then what became the chorus was applied. I really am not sure. I don't remember. This was a few years ago. But nonetheless, the chorus has to be the rise point. It needs to have some kind of Singability, it's the thing that you really want to use to get people into your thing. Going, oh, well, the verse is, is not going to get anybody into anything is a massive mistake because it's the thing that makes things deeper. Yes, people may start with your, uh, with your chorus, I was made for loving you, baby. But it's the verses that will actually consolidate and make people more interested. In using an even bigger picture, uh, I was listening to Best of Cindy Lauper the other day. Girls just want to have fun. She didn't write, she didn't want to sing the song. But without having sung that and hit, then um, Time After Time wouldn't have been a hit. Not because there's anything wrong with the song. Time After Time is a wonderful, wonderful piece of work. But people needed to be open to Cindy Lauper to sit through this slower song to allow it to soak in and go, oh my God, that is amazing. So your chorus is the girls just want to have fun and your verses have to be more time after time. If you don't know those songs, you need to go out and listen to them. Don't work on what you think you know. Listen to girls just want to have fun and then listen to time after time. And if time after time doesn't move you, stop playing with music. You, you don't get it. All right. So verses and chorus. There are Essential backwards and forwards tension and release. We're building something interesting and then we're releasing it into the chorus. We will have breaks and transitions. Breaks, often people just go, oh, well, that's the lead break. Slash steps up onto the piano, goes as fast as he can. Um, yeah, only a bad band does that. Uh, there is a tremendous value for the instrumental break, which we'll get to in a moment, but there are commonly lots of breaks all the way through a track. You'll see a little bit of use of it here, but not as extensive as is quite common. This is a very simple track that we're going to look at. It was deliberately simple. So don't be afraid. If you've got 
a construction where you've gone, particularly verse 1, verse 2 chorus, you're probably going to want verse 1 break, verse 2. Trap type songs, modern rappy type things where people take some music bed off the internet and then start mumbling over the top of it, commonly has no arrangement whatsoever, which is why it's so irrelevant, so unlistenable and so forgettable, uh, and commonly has no breaks whatsoever. Because not only were the breaks not written in by the whoever wrote the backing track, but they have no sense of what the song's going to be on top. The rapper themselves just tend to not realise that they need to shut their stupid gob for a period of time to let something actually breathe. So they just blah, 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 blah. And often they don't even have a verse chorus kind of structure. There's nothing repetitious. There's nothing for us to hang on to. While there can be value in a, a sort of a stochastic, a, a just flow of consciousness kind of thing, you have to be really good to do it. And most of those guys are not good enough to do that kind of thing. So look at breaks and also look at transitions, which is how we move from one block to another, how we move from one section to another. Because if you have duff transitions or no transition, then they just crash into each other. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. And then most commonly at the three quarter point of your piece. So if you've got a three minute piece, then two thirds or three quarters of the way through, you're going to have somewhere about here, something that's different, that breaks what we've currently got and even better, not just going in a random direction, adds something impressive. That is why Slash steps up onto the piano and goes. And what he's playing is actually built out of the important melodies of that piece. The most important melody of that piece most likely being Axel's vocal melody. So it will start with that and it will create variations of that as he goes whittle, whittle, whittle. But it's not random whittle, whittle, whittle. He's not just playing with it. He's actually making intelligent variations of the main melodies and themes of that piece and creating the actual climax and actual resolution. Resolution doesn't mean end. We've got a whole other word for that, and that's called ending. It's the point at which it's like, this is solved. So in the film last night, Black Adams punched the, the, the last bad guy, and then after that, we've got that little bit where the film actually really finishes. Without that, if, if Black Adam just punches the last bad guy and he goes, oh, I give up, uh, and then the film finishes, it'll be even worse than it already was because we need to round things off, which brings us to the ending. And a lot of people put very, very poor endings on this. I push this all the time. The ending is the most important part of that piece once you've got people to listen to it because the way it ends has to be the invitation to have people want to listen to it again. Remember, a DJ is only going to pick your piece to play to the girls who want to wiggle their backsides on a Friday night if he knows they're going to want to wiggle their backsides not just once, but two or three times in the one night. Because if you're in that kind of venue, then you can find yourself playing the same song two or three times in the one night. And that's not abnormal. That, if you are the composer of that piece, if you're Kylie Minogue and your play piece is not being played three times in the night in that kind of venue, you've not done your job right. So what makes people want to do it over again? It's easy to think, well, it's just the chorus in the beginning, but the end has a big part of it. If you disappoint people at the end of your song, are they going to want to start it again only to be disappointed at the end of it? No. So make sure you've got a good end. The most common ending that you hear on poorly constructed work is a cold end. While there can be tremendous power in a cold end, a cold end where something just stops because you couldn't be bothered to do anything better is just telling people, I, I don't care. They won't want to come back. They won't want to care about you. So if you are going to use a just stop, a cold ending, it needs to be powerful. Bloom, bloom. You may even have the fader pull off the end of that symbol to create a cold ending so it's arresting and people are like, oh, you got me there. That was great. Let's do that again. I love the bit where we ran into a brick wall at the end. 
So cold is a very deliberate decision. It should never, ever be a, a ran out of stuff to do. The most common is a chorus to fade, often with ad-libs. So you take a chorus and you just keep going over. Often you have the singer and or various players adding variations, not random shit, variations. And again, if you're not sure what variations mean, go to last week, because that's the important bit. Every part of this course requires the material before. Chorus to fade can be really powerful. People get, oh, but it's old-fashioned fading. It's like, well, get over yourself. Because your job is to make your target audience, for the moment we've said that it's 18 to 23-year-old girls who put their handbags in a circle and wiggle their backsides in an attempt to feel special. And if it does that, then they do feel special. Your job is being done. And if a chorus to fade is going to work really, really well, especially with some cool ad-libs, then this is what you should do. It's not musically the best ending, but you're not interested in musicality. You're interested in actually moving your target audience. And most importantly, at this point in time, making them want to come back again. Because you want them to press play on your song a second time, not on Madonna's song or Kylie's song or Eminem's song or Trailer Swift's song. Because that's a loss for you, because they're going to press play on Trailer Swift's song over and over. You need at least three goes before somebody starts to go, yeah, I really funky dig this song as a general rule of thumb. There are a few times we encounter songs where the first time you hear The Clash is London calling, you're like, and, and you've just got to have it in your life, but that's rare. The chances of you making that every time is, well, it's negligible. You might as well try to win the lotto. Um, so make sure your ending is really powerful and a chorus to fade, especially with ad-libs that keep that moving and changing. Uh, Spice Girls, uh, stop. Stop right now. There's the bit where Sporthead, with her lovely cracked voice, towards the end just provides this immense lift. in, And that keeps running through the end of the song. And the musically most correct version is a cadence. You will commonly hear cadences in live shows, especially with classic rock bands. Bloom, 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 bloom. Again, I've talked about cadences in the earlier stuff. Go back and have a look at them. But a cadence, the big finish, has tremendous value. You can use one of the lesser cadences so that rather than working to the root, you cadence up onto the, uh, onto the fifth or maybe the perfect fourth. There's nothing to stop you from cadencing onto anything. But understand your cadence. If you're cadencing to something less than the perfect full back to the root note or the root chord, then just understand the feeling that you're giving because you're possibly moving a little bit, a little bit towards a cold ending at the same time or what I refer to as a hang. And a hang can be really good when a hang is done right, where you sort of get to the... It's like, oh, wasn't that wonderful? But it's got to be done right. If you watch poor quality horror movies, they work to a cold or a hang and then it's like... It's not a hang, it's just a flop on the floor, like bad jelly. Indoor sphere. Most people watching this are going to be working indoor sphere, so we should cover this. There are fundamentally two types of door layouts. Reason, primarily use what's called linear. I am a linear man. Other doors commonly work with what's called patterns or blocks. Reason has a block feature, which I don't use. I'm just using it for display purposes to give our different sections different colors here. But a pattern sequencer, Fruity Loops, I think is still very much a pattern-based thing, is that you build your little sections. So we say, oh, well, I'll build a chorus and I'll build a verse, and then we butt them together. One of my earlier sequences was like that. And I had these patterns, so you build a pattern and then you arrange them into lists of pattern A, B, C, D. Uh, be very careful in particular with the block or pattern approach. While there's value in it, the problem is, as you know, that you butt them together. We need them to interleave. There needs to be a transition as we move from our verse into our chorus, as we move from our chorus into our next verse, as we move from our chorus into the screaming guitar solo, as we move out of the screaming guitar solo into either another break or 
to the, the choruses that are going to go to fade. They actually need to do this, not this. So even if you're using a linear mode, as I do here, and so when I've constructed, let's say I've constructed this bit first, and I'm just going to drag it out to here and go, OK, and then I'm going to go again and again and again, that's essentially just using patterns or blocks. We've got to make sure that these transition and that they flow into each other. That's a massive part of um, arrangement and a thing that's commonly not done. And I'm not going to pretend to be the total master of it, but I know the more I pay attention to it, the better I get away with what I do do. So really, you don't always have to do an awful lot, but if you ignore these things, then your music doesn't flow. Remember, arrangement's all about flow. It's the big picture flow. It's what people feel. They're, most people are able to say, oh, that's probably the verse and that's probably the chorus. They can't necessarily tell you what musical constructions they use, but they can tell as a verse and they can tell as a chorus because this is the form of our piece. And remember, the song must flow. And if you don't have flow between your sections, that you've just butted them together and gone, oh, well, that's a perfect chorus and that's a perfect verse, I'll jam them together and they must be even more perfect together, they have become less perfect because they fall apart. As these two encounter, the audience goes, what the fuck just happened? It was just like, I, I thought I was with Kylie Minogue and now I find that I'm with Divine. It's like, I feel somewhat gypped right now. Sorry, Divine. Uh, it's really important that we create some sort of transition. Otherwise, we create a conflict which makes people go, nah, this is broken, I don't dig this anymore. Whereas if we can have people want to travel from here to there, so I meet Kylie in a bar and she says, you can have me, provided you uh, look after my friend Divine first. It's like, okay. Transition. I know that's a little blunt, but hopefully the humour of it will stick with you to make you remember that your arrangement is about how do I move from place to place with a good flow that people want to take and that will make them want to flow into the next section. If you don't make them want to flow into the next section, they'll just flow away. They'll leave the dance floor. They'll pick up their, their, their little handbags and they'll go off and drink gin and tonic. Uh, and they won't come back until that funky in excess song is back on. You don't want that at all. Always focus on the end user here. Right, in the second part of this, we're going to look at an actual piece. It's as close to a song as I do these days. It is a form of rock and roll, uh, which is leaning to some extent on a little bit of goth. But if we get right into the heart of it, it is in many ways a rock and roll song that's quite close to the idea of uh, instrumentals like the shadows. So Hank Marvin's Shads, there is a lot borrowed from that. Let's have a bit of a listen. That's our intro. So what have we got here? Obviously there's a start, there's something arresting. And we're also showing our wares. So we're not only showing something arresting in this, in quotes, guitar sound, it's a synth. It's not samples, it's a pure synth. It's arresting. It's got a nice rhythm and a groove to it with uh, the delays and what have you. It shows the wares and then it gets a little bit interesting. And then we get this transition which leads us to, oh, something's happening now. So we've covered all the things that we really need need to do. I could possibly have put a, uh, a synth pad, you know, a, a string or something in there, and I may well have tried that. But if I did, I felt like it took away 
more than giving this sort of mysterious, driven sort of feel. So hopefully you picked those parts. We've started. We've got some something that's a bit arresting. We're showing the wares. We're setting the scene. There is something a little intense about this, but there's also got a real pace to it. That's like ooh. Note that there is two lots of use of the drum in the transition. The first one, just like, and then another little bit that ups the level of excitement. Part one, that's our intro. Now this actually goes into a chorus. It's a little hard for me to work out which was verse and chorus, but I think this is obviously the chorus. We start here. More of everything. So we've got exactly the same guitar riff that we had here. We've just added a lot more of everything. We've got our drums in. We've got our bass in. And a second guitar line. which in this case is playing exactly the same thing as the first. So we're just doubling up and making everything like, it. and it's pretty exciting stuff. So we've really hammered into the chorus right from the beginning. But here that there are drum rolls here. So the drumming is, it is courtesy of Rex Loops, uh, unusual for me. So that verse is actually a, it's a variation and it's simplified. I think from memory, I actually wrote this second, I, but I don't, there's no right or wrong on here. But here, how this finishes and leaves us, finishes with a little bit of a hang on the guitar. And then, We've introduced new elements. This is the first time we hear this string. Very taxing on the player, this line. And it just hangs there. So it creates a harmonic contrast. Everything else is moving around and this string is sitting there. And it creates a tension and a harmonic contrast as these harmonies move around. Our guitar, Line is different and simplified, and then we bring in the second guitar as a counter melody. So we've got two counter melodies here with the string. And then back to that chorus. Chorus is home here. We've said right from the beginning, this is home. So it's odd, we could almost call that verse a break. This is really all a way of carrying that chorus. So we got the chorus, but now we've got a string in it. We didn't have the string first time. It's just adding more body and drive to the center of that melody line. Back to the verse. But it's a bit different again now. So your verses don't always want to be the same. This is a danger of using the, the block or pattern approach. You say, okay, well, that's the perfect verse, and it'll just stay there. No, you want it to move. You want it to change. So I can't remember offhand musically how different 
this is from that, but I think it is essentially a variation of the same thing, that where this is kind of block, the guitar's playing block kind of thing. Here he's playing a pattern which sits between the verse and the chorus, and so it's got this nice sort of groove to it, in part with the delays as well. And the guitars are playing slightly different things. Now, do you notice what this was doing, especially as we get into here? We could have crashed back into the chorus, but I want to build more tension because the chorus is the payoff, it's the bit that we all want, you know, like with Kylie's new song. The verses are a bit, we, but we do want to hear her go padam padam. This is holding that chorus off a little bit. It's giving us elements of it, but not quite letting us have it. And here, there, how it's rising. It's building tension. It's like we're going there, we're going there. I do drop at this point because that chorus needs to come in sort of where it is. I, I can't play it an octave higher and actually have it work. Maybe someone else can. I can't. So the thing is, I have this go, we're going up, we're building this expectation. The scare's coming. No, it's not. You sure? There it is. So there's a little break now of the year, so. And while it may seem that well that break's just nothing happening, we've got a few things happening here. There's a little bit of something from the drum, but there's a hangover in here with our guitar and uh, bass and string. So they just create a little bit of a hold. They're, they're creating a comfortable break, which is a form of tension. And then we tell it it's coming, and there it is. Notice the string has been dropped this time round. I've marked that as verse. I probably shouldn't have. Written, but it's not quite the same as a chorus. Our string is back in. I think that really is more it's more chorus, but it's a it's a variation of the chorus, so it's not as directly strong. I can see why I marked it as the verse, but So we're using the chorus material, but we're also giving more emphasis to this string. That keeps it interesting. Back to our verse variations. But notice how the string is playing a different line. You can even see that what it's playing here is not the same as what it was playing here. So we've got constant movement while we're using the same essential parts over and over. We've got variation all the time. Otherwise the song would become irrelevant because it's like, yeah, I've heard that before. So there's a nice little figure in the string there where it takes elements of what's happening. And this is a variation of our main guitar line. 
Yes, it leaps about, but it works in its own way. It's arresting. The string is very much there, but it's settling in a little bit for that little hang break. Where we expect we're going to get a chorus, we get a variation of the verse again. And I remember I experimented with breaks here, and it just didn't work. I wanted this to be like, yeah, you wanted the, the chorus here, you expected it, but I gave you something that wasn't quite it. And then... There you go. And the string is playing its own version of that melody. And then the ending. So it's using a version of the cadence. It's not a fully grand cadence, it's a little light on. So there's a sense of hang, and then a cold end. So we've got a combination on our ending of cadence and cold. It's more cadence than anything else, but we create a hang. And then cut it off. So it's a little from column A, a little from column B, but it's primarily a cadence. It's, it's a cadence using the big psh at the end, except I've made it hang and pulled the two parts apart from each other. So rather than making it here at the point where we hit the cadence, bloom, bloom, blam, and having the psh at that point, I've just created a gap in the middle. So used a few devices at once. That's it. It's a tight little piece. Again, please don't be asking yourself, oh, well, how can I follow this guy if, if I don't like his music? I'm not teaching you how to make my music. I'm teaching you how to make your own music. How you get there is entirely up to you. And we haven't covered the, um, the unique variations of genre yet. This is getting us close to it because I'm playing you a genre piece. It's got elements of that sort of Hank Marvin Shadows kind of construction, but it's also got elements of uh, early 80s Gothic rock. It's a little bit more Gothic rock than goth as such, but there's a fine line between those. So it now starts to show genre, despite the fact that the construction is really exactly everything that I've been showing you before, it's just obviously a little bit more complicated, and I had more time than an hour to spend on this. This took a little while to put together, and most importantly, this took a lot of time to learn to be able to achieve this, and this is really very simple. Anyone with a lot more ability than me, Sting or Prince or anybody, would probably look at this and go, oh, geez, Benedict, that's really basic work. I would hope that they would go, that's pretty effective and cool, but it's really basic work. But I'm not concerned about that. I'm not concerned about how basic it is. I'm concerned about how effective it is. Because some of the most effective songs are surprisingly basic. The Ramones, surprisingly basic, but very effective. Uh, I went to see a, uh, an Oz rock band called the Radiators, and their first hit single, Coming Home, is <laughs> very basic, but very, very effective. Most people fell in love with that song on first listen, myself included. Uh, so don't ever think that you need to be complex for the case of proving how cool you are to yourself. You want to be as simple as possible. And in many ways, this is simple. It uses simple devices, but it relies so much on variation and the big picture of variation being arrangement to keep everything moving so that while we're listening to the same basic piece of material over and over for three and a half almost minutes, it stays interesting and fun to listen to. That's important because this is 
what you need to be doing with your own stuff. If you're working in prog, obviously you're probably going to be a little bit more complex, but remember plenty of progs bands had hits with quite simple material. It just seems more complex from the tarting up that they've done on top of it. A couple of other things to be aware of, you may have noticed that there's a tempo lane. So we've got some changes in tempo. This is an arrangement thing, but it may be being a done as we're writing the song. There is always a little bit of bleed from one to another, but understanding what you need to be focusing on more at any given point in time is important. So like as I'm working on the arrangement and I go, yeah, look, I need to have these breaks work, then I'll go back inside here and I'll open this up and I'll be going, okay, for arrangement, I need this bit here to do that bit there. In which case, I'm working on arrangement, but I'm moving back into variation mode to get that actual little task, that little bit done, and each instrument doing its part. To make the big arrangement, I'm working on variations in a smaller focus. So you've got to be able to move in and out. Okay, back to the tempo. So we start at 119, we move to 117, we actually slow down. We start fairly fast. I mean, we are hammering on in here. That's very fast for um, trap standards, but it's it comes across as almost a little fast. And then it settles into this kind of loping, grooving feel out of here. So we're giving people a little bit of a rest. And then we come back to the 119, it's like storming. And we stay there. Until here, where we finally reintroduce that chorus, despite having held people off for, was it 245 to 302? So 15 or so seconds we've held them off, which is a long time. And that comes back in and that's faster again. And it stays at 121 through to the end. So part of the arrangement is handling tempo and feel. And when you're listening to this, you probably don't realize that it's changed tempo at all because you're not meant to, but you should probably have some sense of, oh, that's eased a little bit. The drive that was there has eased a bit and it becomes just a little bit more sort of cool groovy than Groovy. To the Bosphorus, as in terms of the story, is about the um, Persian army rushing to the Bosphorus, which is a river around Constantinople, obviously trying to cut off the Constantinopolians and the, um, the, the Pope's uh, army coming in to try to save the Constantinopolians. So that's what to the Bosphorus actually means. It's a rushing into battle song trying to beat the enemy. I think I had been watching a documentary about that battle, but I liked that. So it's got this strong sense of drive and that's the backstory that I'm working with as it goes through. So this constant sense of rushing, driving, galloping is endemic in the song. So tempo is part of our arrangement. Really important to be aware of that. I don't always change tempo a lot, I will admit. Uh, but do be aware of tempo, especially if you are looking for a pop or a radio song. There is also some level automation in here. There's not a lot, but we can see that we change uh, the level of our string a few times through the piece. These don't actually change as much as I thought, this just stops this string from coming in too loud. It lets it work its way in and become a little bit more powerful as it goes through. And because it's full level here and a bit more active, then it just seems to take the stage a little bit more. I, I thought from memory it might have been because of extra level, but it's not. I've just handled the level and then I'm reducing the level of the string at the end. Because 
because as we've got less stuff there, that swirly, turgid phase can become a little aggressive. So we just pull it back to make the mix work. That was really more a mix decision than it was a, an arrangement decision, but it is worth being aware of. Is my player too loud at this point? If you're going to mix it yourself, okay, you might be going, oh, I'm making mixed decisions now, but try to separate it out and go, what level should my player be hammering away at here? It's all very well to start with a drummer who's playing at 150% of his ability or level uh, at, from the very moment and then going, well, where am I going with the chorus? Because he needs to get more, more. And if you start at 150, where's he going? You know, he's got nowhere to go. He's actually going to get tired before the song is finished. And you might go, oh, yeah, well, Dr. Avalanche, the drum machine, he doesn't care. He's going to do whatever I tell him to do. But you've got to remember your audience, what you want them to do. Remember if you've got those um, 18 to 23-year-old girls um, after their uh, um, week of, of boring office job standing around their handbags wiggling their backsides, uh, you don't want to tie them out before the end of your song. So you've got to use level, how each player performs, at what kind of pitch, level, what have you, how much drive they're putting into this section, so that it goes up and down. And in this case, remember, we actually go down a little in tempo to, so they can have some furious backside wiggling, and then they can have some, you know, slightly more sedate, groovy, I feel, sexy backside wiggling, and then we lead them back into the furious backside wiggling. Our girl's going to backside wiggle to this, probably not. I just want to give that kind of image. I want to give you something that's emotively memorable and hopefully humorous so you remember that as you're going through your own pieces and going, what reaction am I giving my target audience? I know that my target audience here is not that. Who they are, I struggle to identify, but I know they're like me, so I can just look in a mirror in that sense. Alrighty, so this is the really important thing that we want to do. We're just under the hour, so my timing is pretty good. Is that, remember, the overview is that the arrangement is handling the big picture. You handle the big picture with little details. You don't handle the big picture with big details. Because that becomes just saying, I've got the perfect verse, I've got the perfect chorus, now I'm going to jam the pair of them together because now you've done damage. Yes, you may have the perfect verse and the perfect chorus, but by jamming them together like this, they don't fit. So it's the little details that are gonna make the difference. It's the things like that, that happens in the middle there that helps drive us into this chorus. It's the little details like That makes the difference. Also, remember, all the way through here, our string line is almost always doing different things. We do copy, that's going to be exactly the same as that. But most of the rest of this, or well, that's the same as that, most of the rest of this is actually different. So rather than being lazy and composing one string part and just going copy paste, copy paste, copy paste, copy paste, which is pattern thinking, um, it's always different. So all the way through here, we've got a chorus without it. And something which is chorus based, but a little different. Can't remember offhand how it's different, but it is maybe just the addition of that string. What happens if I just mute this? Do they sound exactly the same? Now, they do sound different. Something is made different there. I can't remember what it is. It doesn't rightly matter. But we've got these variations all the way through that is same but different. And that's all in the little details of how we've handled this. Maybe that's a velocity. I really don't know. But with constant movement, we can take this pretty small piece of information, which is, well, there I've got 16 seconds we could cut that in half and say it's eight seconds, but we can cut that in half again and say it's about four seconds worth of material that we've dragged out to almost three and a half minutes. And we've done that by understanding the big picture. 
those girls in the disco wanting to wiggle their bottoms after their week of not being able to have Friday night drinks, and we can keep them engaged for three and a half minutes of their grey little lives, and they're going to feel great about that. And that's our job. But we've got to handle that with the small details, and the small details are what creates the flow that is a great song. And rappers are all about flow, and they have to be because it's their only weapon. You've got to be about flow as well because it is your only weapon. You have a greater thing to pull on. You've got to pull on more elements because you've got to pull on the drums, you've got to pull on the bass, you've got to pull on the guitars, you've got to pull on the strings, you've got to pull on the, the DX7 that's going bit, bit, bit using the, uh, the, the, the bells preset, whatever you're doing but you've got to make the whole thing flow and everybody's got to be playing their part. And if you're playing the um, producer in particular, then it means that you are coming up with the initial idea. Um, you're taking those ideas and making them work with the arrangements and then the production and then the mixing. So if you're doing that all in one box, as I do uh, for my own work, then you've got to be all over all of those things, which is, of course, as anyone in Nashville knows, impossible. So you really are better off separating out. You go to Nashville. I took this to Nashville and they said, that's all right. We can get that up on the radio. They would pull it apart. I would sit there and be like, <laughs> I'm so pathetic. I'm so useless. <laughs> whilst they brought in probably 12 different experts. Oh, yep, we've got an expert on what we're going to do at bar 48 and 49. And some guy will come in and he'll go, and bar 48 and 49 is going to be like, I feel so useless, I couldn't do it myself. But that's because he's a specialist in doing that bit. This is a really important thing that most people don't learn uh, until it's far too late, that while we may not be at the level of Nashville, where we bring in lots of specialists to do all these little bits and pieces that they are just experts at for whatever freakish reason, luck, chance, or just the fact that they were born that way, we can still look a little bit broader and say, okay, who's good at arrangement? Who do I know who's good at arrangement? Who do I know who's good at mixing? And bring in these people so that we can manage a bigger picture and get our song to flow. Because you can have an amazing idea that's poorly arranged and it'll die. You can have a pretty mediocre idea uh, and with a good arrangement, it will fly. There's plenty of material from the, the early to mid 90s as pretty mediocre ideas. Um, Ice Ice Baby, that's pretty limited, but with wonderful arrangement, that becomes really special. Uh, Backstreet's Back, that's just all arrangement. There's, just, there's no particular wonderful greatness in that, but with superb arrangement, that is just like absolutely amazing work. I'm not a big fan of Backstreet Boys at all. I don't own any of their stuff. But Backstreet's Back is really impressive work because of the arrangement. Whoever they brought in to do that arrangement, they deserve every cent they got and probably more because that's why it's hit. And that's why if you put it on the radio right now, people will go, because it's really so well arranged. That's a job you need to be doing at this level. But remember, you need to see the big picture, but work on the details and if you just go, oh, well, I'm, gonna, I'm at the big picture, I'm just going to all do all the big picture stuff and ignore all the detail, you butted things together, it's actually broken, and you probably would have been better off not doing that. A great record producer is about being able to see the big picture. Like I'm talking about girls wiggling their backsides, I'm viewing who I think is going to work with this song. Again, I don't think they're going to work with this song. But I'm viewing who who this needs to move, what the task it needs to perform, and then stepping down to the point at which I can do those details to achieve that outcome. 
that's what everybody in your process needs to be doing. And if you're the only guy in your process, well, okay, you've got to do all those things, but it's an awful lot for one guy to be doing, in which case, again, bring in somebody else. If you are great at doing the details, like there are lots of guys who are way better at the music bit, the, the notes and the, than I am, but they can't really write pieces of music that are successful. That's where they need to work with somebody who's more of a record producer to sort of say, hey, look, this is wonderful. The, I, I love that bit, but let's arrange it this way. Let's do this so that we can get the little girls wiggling their backsides rather than sitting back waiting for Inexcess or Kylie or whoever. This is the, the important bit. So work out what your strength is. Focus on that. Yes, learn the other tasks as much as you can, but find someone you work with to do the bits that they are naturally better at because chances are they're not as good at the bits you're good at. And then you're going to get a synergy of greater than the parts. Alrighty, if you have any questions, pop them on down below. Please don't go be sending me private messages about your questions. That is not cool in the situation. If it's a public question because you're not paying private rates, as in you're not paying me one-on-one, -on -one, then make it a public question because somebody else will be asking that question to engage. If you're afraid to be seen as imperfect, you got to deal with that. Go to your therapist to deal with that one. My advice to you as your therapist in the situation is get the hell over yourself because your job is to give girls three and a half minutes of excitement by wiggling their backsides. And to get there, you've got to get things done. And if you don't want people to see you as having to ask questions, then you're more worried about your own short-term ego than you are about your long-term ego of being the guy that makes girls wiggle their backsides for three minutes on a Friday night. That's the thing that you'll be remembered for, not the other trivial things. There was obviously a point at which uh, Achilles in Troy had to learn to wave his sword around. But we don't focus on that when we think about Achilles. No, we, th we focus on his success on the battlefield, and particularly at Troy, of defeating Hector and then sneaking his way in like a sneaky sneak. And that's what we remember him for. Focus on that. Get the job done. And of course, again, a reminder, please, if you're getting value from this, which if you've watched this far, I'm sure you are, head over to my coffee and either make a donation or make a purchase of something or hire me for something off my own website. This is what I do. This is my job to help you improve what you do to get the little girls dancing. You have a great day now.